Hello, my name is Steve Terrett, and I'm delighted to be joined in the BLC box today by the Right Honourable Lord Justice Green. Lord Justice Green is a judge of the Court of Appeal of England and Wales, and he's also the current chair of the Law Commission of England and Wales. Sir Nicholas has a background in the law which spans both academia and legal practice, and amongst the many famous cases that he was involved with as a lawyer, was the groundbreaking case of Factor Tain and the Secretary of State for Transport, which is so famous that it really doesn't require any explanation. Sir Nicholas has also previously served as Chairman of the Bar Council and the Advocacy Training Council. Now, Lord Justice Green has very kindly, uh, I've spoken to him before, and uh, aside from having a wonderful CV, he's an incredibly friendly man. And uh, he very kindly said that I can refer to him without all of the, the grand titles as Nick. So, Nick, thank you very, very much for having joined joining us today. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I would like to discuss uh, two aspects of English law that you're very intrinsically involved with. Firstly, the Law Commission, and then secondly, the, the Court of Appeal. So perhaps we could begin with, with the Law Commission and, and a rather open question of what is the Law Commission and, and why was it created? The Law Commission is a statutory body. We were set up in 1965, uh, over 50 years ago, by an act called the Law Commissions Act. Uh, and uh, th there is a very long history of law reform by independent lawyers uh, indeed, across Europe uh, and in the United Kingdom in Roman times, uh, in the fourth century, there was an extensive independent law reform agency. Uh, various independent law reform agencies existed in Europe in the 15th and 14th centuries. Uh, in the United Kingdom, uh, there was a long discussion about whether there should be law reform in the 18th and the 19th centuries. But it was only in 1965 that we were set up and the Act set up two different law commissions. Uh, one for Scotland, and then a separate one for, for cover it, uh, which covers both England and Wales. Uh, and I'm the chairman of the Law Commission of England uh, and Wales. Now, I say we're statutory, but we're also independent of government. And that's one of the most fundamental uh, aspects of the way we work. Uh, I'm uh, a Court of Appeal judge, uh, and I'm appointed to chair the organisation because I am independent of the state. Uh, I have four commissioners who are also appointed under the statute, and they are also independent of the state. So there are five of us who effectively drive law reform, and each of us has no connection to the state. And that's always perceived to be a great advantage because we are understood by all those we consult and work with to be impartial and objective, uh, and we produce recommendations in the form of a final, a final report to government and to parliament. And it is ultimately up to the government and to parliament to decide whether they accept our recommendations. Um, but they do know uh, that we are an independent body and our research and our recommendations will often be the most acceptable solution to an otherwise difficult or controversial project. Uh, and for that reason, because we have 50 years worth of experience of independence and objectivity, we're trusted. So it might be viewed as a bit of an Anglo-Saxon uh, compromise, but it works. It works uh, very well in practice. Since 1965, we've produced over 230 reports. Uh, we produce reports on average. It's about five different law reform reports per year this year. Uh, with the COVID lockdown, we will almost double our output. We've been extremely busy. We will be producing nearer 10 different reports uh, by the end of the year on a variety of different projects. I thought it might be worth just giving everybody a, uh, a, a summary of the sorts of things that we cover. Please. So at the moment, we are working on about 20 different law reform projects. There are different stages of development. Some were just starting, some are coming close to the end. Uh, the commissioners uh, all specialise in different projects. So we have a commissioner 
who deals with property law and family law. Uh, and his team, Professor Hopkins' team, has just completed four major reports on the reform of leasehold land and, and tenancies. Uh, they're doing a report on weddings. And they're doing the report on surrogacy, child surrogacy. Uh, the criminal law team has just completed and published a report on official secrets and espionage. Uh, we're doing three controversial pieces of work on hate crime, uh, abuse on the internet uh, and indecent images. Uh, we're doing projects on the confiscation of the proceeds of crime, uh, the use of search warrants, meetings, and we have just the government to take on a review of options for reform of corporate crime, bribery and corruption. Uh, the commercial team has ongoing projects on digital assets, uh, smart contracts, electronic signatures, uh, the whole subject of paperless trade in the digital economy uh, and the rights of shareholders uh, in the international economy. And then our public law team uh, has a, a very major long running project on automated vehicles, robot cars, in other words. Uh, we're doing a, a project for the Welsh Government on courts and tribunals, reforming and making the system more, more coherent, our planning law, uh, immigration rules, uh, and employment tribunal. So our work covers the entire spectrum of social, economic and legal problems. And so those are the projects that we've got at the moment. Now, you, you mentioned there are five members of, of the commission. Uh, who, who are the remaining members and, and how are they chosen or appointed? So uh, head of the property and family team, uh, Professor Penny Lewis is head of crime. Uh, Professor uh, Sarah Green is the head of our commercial team and Nicholas Payne, who's a, a judge and the Queen's Council, a barrister, uh, heads our public law team. Um, each of the commissioners is appointed by an independent appointment process. Um, it's a mixed and the, the appointment panel generally comprises a, a very senior civil servant, a senior judge, um, sometimes two judges. Uh, it's run by the Judicial Appointments Commission, which is an independent body that appoints the judges, though there is some ministerial input. But the appointment is then made by that panel and a recommendation is made to the Lord Chancellor, uh, who ultimately has the decision, uh, although there is always input from the Prime Minister uh, as to both the chairman and the commissioners. But it's, a, it's essentially an independent appointment process, recognising that the people that are appointed to the jobs uh, will be in post for a long period of time. The initial period is five years, but it can be renewed once. Uh, and most commissioners will stay for 10 years in total. And they will become very influential public figures and will have a major influence over the area of law that they're responsible for. Um, but you, you, you mentioned that there is a, a separate law commission for, for Scotland. Uh, is, is there also one for, for Northern Ireland? There is one for Northern Ireland, but for uh, various political reasons, it hasn't been operating for the last few years. Um, we've been very keen for it to be resurrected. Uh, we think there is a role in the new Northern Ireland uh, for uh, the Law Commission to start again. There, there is in the Republic of Ireland a Law Commission. We have good relations with them. We meet with them every year. And there are other law commissions around the world, mainly countries as law New Zealand. And again, we have commissions across Africa uh, with whom we regularly correspond and exchange ideas. There's even a law commission in Singapore with whom we exchange ideas mainly on issues relating to the digital economy. There aren't so many bodies such as us in Europe um, though we're aware that academic institutions and universities may propose law reform to government or may be asked by governments to propose or draft you know, new laws, but they're, they're not the same as us in a structural sense. Of course, coordination with, with other countries uh, may be extreme, extremely useful, um, but sometimes our students at the British Law Centre find it fascinating, maybe even incomprehensible that within the same country of the United Kingdom, that there can be different laws in Scotland and different laws in England and Wales. So does that necessitate a far closer 
coordination between what the various uh, law commissions are working on in England and Wales and Scotland and Northern Ireland. Yes, it, it does. So, for example, there is a separate law commission in Scotland. We do a number of joint projects with them um, because uh, within the United Kingdom, some areas also working with them on the project relating to surrogacy uh, of children. Um, and those are two projects which will be published in due course as joint reports. Uh, there will be a single report from both law commissions. Uh, now, whenever the Law Commission of England and Wales uh, produces a report, we will naturally do that for both England and Wales, because a lot of subjects that we cover are reserved subjects. In other words, they cover both England and Wales. But then we also have a very important task, which is, as the Law Commission of Wales, to produce reports on Welsh law. In other words, the law that is devolved to the Welsh Government. Uh, and we view it as important that we work with the Welsh Government on devolved projects, because otherwise we cannot properly perform our function as the Law Commission of Wales. So at any one time, we like to have, at the very minimum, one significant piece of law reform on Welsh devolved law. And we've done that for the last few years. So it is slightly complicated. We work within uh, a jurisdiction which has both centrally reserved laws and devolved laws. Uh, but again, perhaps in traditional Anglo-Saxon Anglo -Saxon compromise fashion, it works pretty well. <laughs> um, now, you mentioned the, the, the very wide range of substantive law issues that, that the Law Commission will be looking at. Um, now, sometimes, of course, the government creates uh, ad hoc commissions that are designed to look at one particular area of law reform. What one that springs to mind uh, recently is, is the uh, independent review of administrative law, which will be chaired by, by Lord Fox. Is there any relationship between the Law Commission and its, should we say, wider scope of uh, judicial, of law reform? and individual ad hoc commissions such as the, the Fox Commission? Uh, the, the short answer is there's no connection whatsoever. Um, so, for example, in relation to the Fox Committee, that's been set up by the government to uh, investigate and look at processes of judicial review. Um, Lord Fox will report to the Lord Chancellor in due course, I believe in the next month or so, uh, and then the government will take a view as to how they wish to proceed. We were, in fact, asked whether we would like to be consulted, and we decided we would not. I've no doubt that people would have views within the Commission, but we are quite independent. Uh, we have our own portfolio of work, uh, and we stick to that. Uh, we don't engage in politics. We are very determined not to be drawn into political issues. Uh, and, and for that reason, we stick to our own portfolio of work, and we don't get involved with the work of other one-off or ad hoc commissions. Now, on, on that subject of, of, indep of independence, um, many countries go to great lengths to keep the judiciary completely separate from, from the process of, of, of law reform. But as chair of the Law Commission, you are also a Lord Justice of Appeal. Uh, Lord Fox, of, of course, is, is a judge. But why is that that the UK decides to involve the judiciary in the process of law reform? And, and what advantages come from having a senior judge as, as the chair of a law reform institution? Well, as I hope everybody knows, the, the judiciary in England and Wales, and indeed in Scotland, are completely separate from government. Um, a starting point is that when we're appointed, uh, we, give an, we make a, a judicial oath. And the oath we give, uh, which we give in open court in a, in a ceremony, is to the Queen, to the Crown. We do not uh, owe any allegiance to the state or to the government or to parliament. Uh, our allegiance is expressed in public to be to the Queen because she is the representative or proxy of the rule of law and the people. So the way in which we give our judicial oaths is em emphasizes the difference between us and the state. Now, one of the reasons why in 1965 it was decided that a, a senior judge uh, should chair the Law Commission was to guarantee the independence of the Law Commission from government. 
because it was recognised the judges were rigorously independent, uh, pathologically independent. <laughs> it was viewed as a, a guarantor of the independence of the Law Commission from interference by the state. So I view the two as consistent, uh, sympathetic. They are the same principle. They, they are a guarantee of independence. Um, so that's why a judge chairs the Law Commission. It is either a High Court judge uh, or a Court of Appeal judge. Uh, there are we're, we're a small group in actual numbers uh, and we sit right at the top of the judicial system in this country. No, of, of course, the, the independence uh, from, from the government is, is absolutely crucial in terms of making the reforms. Uh, but ultimately, if the legislation is to be adopted, we would need the government to, to take on board the, the suggestions that, that the Commission is making. So what is there any collaboration at, at that level in terms of assessing whether there is government support for, for the reforms that you are proposing? We're very determined not to be a purely academic institution producing reports of immense interest but of no practical use. Uh, and if you go back 20 or 30 years, a number of our reports were uh, applauded loudly by academics, but no government. Uh, and just over 10 years ago, we decided that we needed to have a different relationship with government, and we signed a protocol with government, which means that we will not take on a project unless we have in advance a written statement from a minister uh, expressing a serious intention to implement the output of our work. Now, of course, the minister is not bound by that. It's not a binding commitment on the government. And when we enter into uh, a project, when we first start upon it, we do not know what our end conclusions will be, nor does the government. But in practice, that means that we have a very high implementation rate. To give you an example, since uh, 19, uh, since 2010 uh, and ending with 27, we we produced 47 reports, 45 have been essentially accepted by government. So that's a very high success rate. Uh, and, and that means that we are able to fulfil our statutory task of reforming the law. Um, for five independent lawyers to be able to reform the law, you have to work closely not only with your stakeholders, with everybody affected in society and economy and business and so on, but also with government. Uh, there is no point in us coming up with recommendations which are simply unacceptable to Parliament. Uh, and that's where our independence is very important. We sit in the middle of this process. We talk uh, to a huge number of different people. We receive sometimes in excess of a thousand submissions on a particular project. And then we work our way through the middle to come up with workable legislative solutions. And of course, we therefore have to understand what government priorities are. But at the end of the day, because government trusts us, uh, we have a very successful implementation rate. So I, I put that down largely to a function of our independence uh, and the fact that over 50 years, you know, we've been trusted to do good work, high quality work. Absolutely. And now, you, you, having mentioned Parliament, mm, we know that, that finding time to debate new legislation in Parliament is something that, that's very difficult. Um, so does the Law Commission have to go through those same parliamentary procedures as, as every other member of Parliament who may want to propose legislative reform or, or other special procedures that the Commission can use? That, that's a very good question. But before answering it specifically, let me stand back and provide a bit of context. I was appointed chairman uh, two years ago. And uh, as everybody who watches this will know, the United Kingdom has been having its own uh, little internal uh, difficulties with Europe. Uh, the Brexit process, the referendum, the negotiations have taken up a vast amount of parliamentary time. And that has had the effect of squeezing out uh, many other important pieces of legislation. It became obsessed. Politicians had a great deal to think about other than ordinary legislative reform. So we have been through a period over the last few years where there hasn't been much time in Parliament uh, for other matters. Now, for good or for ill, that is coming to an end. We have a government with a significant majority and there is now the ability for uh, non-Brexit related matters to go through Parliament. 
Uh, and although we have a backlog of uh, bills waiting to be adopted, uh, we're starting to make headway with that. And uh, I do anticipate over the next one to three years that a, a quite a high percentage of our backlog will be implemented. So I don't particularly see that as a problem. Now, a lot of our legislation will go through the ordinary parliamentary procedure. It will be scrutinised by parliamentary committees. It will be debated in the House of Commons and the House of Lords. And amendments may be made to our proposals, and we're entirely comfortable with that. But there are pieces of legislation, often which are technical and complex, where we're able to use a very specialised procedure called the Law Commission Special Procedure. Uh, and when we use that, it will be because we have agreed in advance with, uh, with government and with parliament that there's no serious opposition to our proposal. Uh, and it means that it can uh, benefit from an accelerated procedure through parliament. Uh, the bill isn't, doesn't start in the House of Commons, it starts in the House of Lords. It's subject to fairly intensive scrutiny, uh, and but it then receives reduced amount of debate time uh, on the floor of the House of Commons and House of Lords. Uh, and we will use this procedure for technical legislation that everybody agrees needs to be adopted and where there's no serious opposition to any of our proposals. So we use both procedures. We use the ordinary legislative procedure and we use the special procedure uh, in those circumstances where there's essentially agreement that it simply needs to go through quickly. OK, that's that, that's really interesting. Um, now, as chair of the, of the commission, um, having mentioned all of those areas where, where the, the commission is involved uh, with in making reforms now, do you as chair of the commission have the possibility to influence what, what are perceived to be reform priorities? Or where do you get the ideas from in terms of what to choose, which areas of law to look at? There are essentially two different ways in which we, uh, as it were, compile our menu. Um, there's, first of all, something called the general programme. Uh, and we negotiate this with government every three or four years. We're just about to embark upon a process of negotiating our 14th programme. Uh, and that programme uh, will probably be agreed, I would imagine, sometime in the first half of 2022, in about 18 months. So you all will understand how we come to agree what we're going to take on. Uh, over the next few few months we will be having an internal debate within government as to their priorities. We're speaking to senior civil servants, to government ministers about what interests them, uh, about the sorts of things that within their departments they think need to be done. In about four or five months time we will launch a public consultation uh, and we will invite members of the public to suggest law reform topics to us. Now in the past we may get well over a thousand responses. I think for our 13th programme, we have 1,300 responses. Um, often pressure groups will try and flood us with suggestions. <laughs> 1,300 responses may be far fewer actual projects. I think 1,300 submissions boiled down to about 200 different topics last time. Uh, we then filter those. We go through a selection process having discussed them with government, and we will ultimately come to a list of between 12 and 15 legislative projects, and we will agree these with government, and that will then form a good part of our work for the next few years. Now, on top of that, we take on what's called ministerial references, uh, and those may be issues that we're aware from our discussions within government uh, are, are problems. Uh, and we may have discussions, and I may be closely involved in debates and discussions within government about the possibility of a Law Commission project. Sometimes there may be 12 months, 18 months of discussion. Uh, and then there's a period of negotiation where we will agree terms of reference. Uh, and then we will embark upon a project. To, to give an example, um, myself and my criminal law commissioner about 18 months ago, decided that uh, the law relating to corporate crime uh, had difficulties and uh, the, ser the serious fraud office that conducts the prosecutions of corporate crime was not succeeding in as many prosecutions as it believed it ought to. And there were problems. 
And we have now been tasked to take on a review of different models for reform of corporate crime. And we're combining our criminal team with our commercial team so we can look at both the criminal law aspects, but also the commercial and regulatory aspects of, com of corporate crime. Uh, and we're going to produce a report on different options for reform, probably in 12 to 15 months. Uh, and that's not in our programme. It was something which I discussed with senior judges, with politicians, uh, on and off over the course of the last 12, 15 months. And so that comes up, if you like, on an ad hoc basis. It's a ministerial reference. Uh, the government have signed a, 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 a terms of reference and a memorandum of understanding indicating that there's a serious intention to implement uh, the reforms that we propose at the end of the day. So that's how we get our work. Now, uh, my job uh, is not to run individual projects, but I have the privilege of being able to interfere in all of the projects of my different commissions <laughs> uh, and express a view. Uh, and I often discuss with commissioners areas that we think are important and we may go to ministers and say issue you think the projects evolve as appropriate for us. I should say that we will not involve ourselves in projects which are intrinsically political. Uh, what's political obviously depends upon the government of the day and can change from month to month. If the government has a very clear view that it wants to do something, uh, and it's not interested in having detailed research, then that's not really for us. Uh, we wouldn't accept a reference and government generally wouldn't suggest that we take on that sort of project. So we're looking for the more technical projects, you know, a very broad consultation exercise, a huge amount of evidence collection, really detailed intellectual academic analysis. That's what we specialise in. And if a government were to change, let's say that government X were to say that it is in favour of reforming a particular area of law and it gives the non-binding, but the, the political commitment that it would it would consider implementing this. And then an election were to come along and a, a different government comes into power. But the Law Commission has already begun looking at potential reforms of that area of law. D does it does that area of law and that consideration then does it get put on the back burner or, or does the Commission continue with it regardless of the new government having declared that it doesn't want to reform this area of law? We continue. But of course, it does happen. Um, it happens even with governments of the same persuasion. So, for example, uh, recently Boris Johnson has become Prime Minister, uh, succeeding Theresa May, and there was a change in the Cabinet and they have different views to their predecessors, even though it's within the same Conservative government. We work with every government, uh, we will not, because it would be inconsistent with our independence, simply abandon a project just because some minister doesn't like it. Uh, we find in practice that it's not a problem. There are research projects, reform projects that we undertake, which different governments have different views about. But in practice, we will proceed to produce our report. It's then up to government whether it wishes to implement it. But by the nature of the work that we take on, um, government will generally recognise this is a subject that needs reform. Um, different governments may have different views about implementation, but uh, it's a very good question, but it doesn't arise as a problem very often. OK, OK. And, and are, are there any areas of, of law that are simply outside the, the possible or potential scope of what the Commission can look at? No, uh, absolutely anything is theoretically within the scope of our work. Um, but as I, I've already said, we would be very nervous about taking on something which one would describe as political with a small p, something which government felt strongly about um, and which then, you know, what we don't want to do is to do an extremely high quality, very well researched and evidence based piece of work. And then the government simply say, well, for ethical, ethical or moral reasons, we just don't believe in it. That's mm. a waste of our time. So we will have a discussion about what is appropriate to take on with government. Um, but in, in principle, there's nothing which is outside the scope of what we can take on. OK, well, we, we are, as an aside, we, we are currently teaching contract law to the students of the British Law Centre. And I think if you were to 
let us know which email address they could send their, their suggestions to, then uh, con consideration and promissory estoppel may be quite high at the top of, of, of their yeah, list. Because yeah. In the realm <laughs> of contract law, of course, our, our, our new commissioner, uh, Professor Sarah Green, she's a great expert in the entire area of the digital economy and contract law. Uh, and, and that's something which the um, United Kingdom is considered to be extremely important. So we have a whole series of projects looking at uh, the operation of contract law in a digital and AI based economy. Um, we are just out starting upon a, a project relating to smart contracts, you know, digitally implemented contracts, and we will be issuing a, a, a call for evidence in relation to that in the very near future. Uh, and the paper that we're about to publish sets out a, a very detailed description of how contract law applies to digital transactions. Uh, and it raises some problems of universal application across the world, not just to English contract law. So your students might be interested to look at that paper when it's published, which should be Absolutely. within the next you know, four to eight weeks. Fantastic. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll make sure that it features on, on the reading list. Um, now, you, you, you mentioned, um, I think, two, two things, of course, they're, they're the hot topics of, of the moment, which is COVID-19 pandemic and, and, and Brexit. Um, so that they, they, they open up a, a range of potential uh, questions. Um, in relation to COVID, then I suppose there's a question of timing, which is how quickly could the Commission react to events on, on the ground? Is everything uh, it's likely to take a, a few years and that would impact on the kinds of questions you look at or to come up with forms crises, uh, shall we say, such as the COVID-19 pandemic. A, a typical law reform project would take between one and three years. So, so let me just right. explain why, and then I'll come back and deal with how we deal with crises. Uh, and that's because the way we work is as follows. Uh, the team that is set up will, first of all, uh, conduct informal consultations with stakeholders. And they may speak to 50, 100 individuals and groups uh, to delineate a problem, obtain preliminary evidence. And we then produce a consultation paper. That consultation paper may be two, three hundred pages long. We produce glossy, short summaries. But by the time we produce a consultation paper, a huge amount of work will be done. Mm -hmm. A lot of research will have been undertaken. And we will then uh, endeavour to set out some very provisional recommendations. Sometimes we put out recommendations, sometimes we ask open questions, sometimes we pose a problem and say to our consultees, please provide us with evidence. But it will be a very detailed piece of work. Now that takes time. and. and big project, it would be at least a number of months before we can issue a consultation paper, sometimes a year. Mm -hmm. Then when you allow time for consultation, which will be three, four, five months, we may receive a thousand responses. So then we've got to read and analyze them and then draft a final report, uh, which could, so that can take quite a long time. So you'll see that it, by the nature of what we do, it takes a certain amount of time. Now, how do we then deal with crises? How do we respond to something like COVID? Well, we've been giving a great deal of thought internally to this very issue. Uh, so far as the COVID crisis itself is concerned, uh, we did provide advice to government on a number of issues where we have expertise. The two in particular, uh, which came across, uh, which were relevant to us, were marriages and wills, uh, because uh, it's very difficult to get married <laughs> distance, or if you can't get married indoors. And of course, our laws don't take account of these health concerns. But same for a will. If you're leaving your property in a will, under our somewhat antiquated laws, the will has to be signed and authenticated by someone who witnesses the signature, generally in the same room in person. But we don't have proper mechanisms for electronic author uh, authorization or authentication. Now, the government realized that they had to make provision for marriages and wills in the course of the crisis for obvious human reasons. And our laws just didn't 
take account of that. So we provided advice to government, but that has led us to think long and hard about how legislation should react to crises, because I think most people will assume that the COVID-19 crisis is not going to be the only crisis that the world faces. If you think back, we've had virus-related crises across the world about once every four or five years since the mid-1980s. Why should we assume that we won't get similar crises in the future? Uh, and we're looking long and hard at how legislation should cope with crises in the future, because legislation doesn't provide flexibility to governments to take very extreme short term action. It doesn't allow laws to be modified for short periods of time to take account of these sorts of crises. So we started on an internal project to look at how legislation as an instrument can be better framed in order to deal with the crises of the future. Um, so that's one thing we're looking at relating to uh, legislation flowing out of COVID. We call it resilience. How do you make law more resilient, more flexible, more adaptable? Um, you, you mentioned Brexit, of course, because it's such a politically sensitive subject, we have been nervous about being involved until such time as it's happened. Once it's over, I think there will be a role for the Commission to play in tidying up the statute book, in assisting the government on new project which departs from retained EU law. And I think there'll be relatively technical issues where the government thinks that they want to do something, but perhaps doesn't know how. They may ask us to respond in a very short period of time. So we're giving thought to how we can conduct short technical exercises involving uh, abbreviated consultations. Uh, possibly we'll do the drafting of legislation at the same time as we consult, so to be a condensed process. Um, and that's something we're giving thought to at the moment. So coming back to your original question, yes, we do take time. Uh, we take pride in the fact that because we take time, we do a very, very detailed job, and that's part of the reason why we're successful. We're also very conscious of the fact that we need to be able to respond to crises, to changes in the economy, uh, and we're looking at how we can reform our procedure to take that into account. Okay. Again, linking to something that we've been looking at fairly recently with the British Law Centre students, um, what, one of the questions was about interpreting statutes. And it, it's just struck me that um, as a judge in the, the Court of Appeal, you may well come into contact with a statute with whose history you, you are very intimately involved. It may have begun as, as a reform proposal at, at the Law Commission. Um, is, is that a realistic possibility? And, and if it were to happen, would you be would you have to recuse yourself from that case? Because in a sense, you know too much about the statute. Yes. Well, um, in those circumstances, the very least I would do would be to disclose to the parties that I was the chairman of the Law Commission when the legislation was adopted. Now, every single document that is published by the Law Commission is signed by myself and my four commissioners. We take collective responsibility for every single consultation paper and report. So I would not be able to say you know, that I have not agreed with this report. Um, I chair the meetings of commissioners where we peer review uh, the team's works and where we finalise and approve reports. So I do therefore have a view. Um, in, in practice, the report will speak for itself. Uh, if the parties objected in a case because they thought I had a view which was expressed in a report, um, I suspect I would probably recuse myself. Uh, it doesn't happen very often. Uh, law Commission reports are cited in courts uh, as guidance material for judges, uh, demonstrating what a legislation might mean. If the government has accepted our report, then it's a good, it's part of the travaux preparatoire, if you like, of legislation. It's an admissible background material. I haven't yet come across a situation where I've had to recuse myself from sitting, but it's not impossible. And I think I would err on the side of caution if one party or one party or other thought there was an appearance that I might be conflicted or biased. Before we move on to to looking at your your role in the Court of Appeal, since we've, we've 
edged toward towards that that topic. Is, is there anything that you think that perhaps I, I may have missed in terms of, of asking you about about the Law Commission that you think uh, people may not know or or, or that uh, I just haven't touched all of the bases? Um, well, perhaps because many people who watch this are students, I should give a little bit of an explanation of what we're like as as a body. Um, we're about 70 strong in number. Uh, I've got 65 lawyers and researchers. Um, each year we take on uh, about 20 researchers. Uh, these are young lawyers often who have just finished university or postgraduate work uh, or who are about to embark upon joining the professions as an advocate or lawyer. And they spend a year or two years with us working uh, in the teams on a particular project. Uh, and they're a fantastic bunch each year. I'm amazed at their intellect, their energy, uh, their lack of deference. Uh, they are uh, an extremely interesting, enthusiastic, motivated uh, group of individuals. And they, they add a real buzz to the Law Commission. Now, over and above that, I've got, you know, we're about 65 strong. Uh, so there are, uh, we're a very small administrative team behind that. The support team is very small. Um, each team that works on a project is quite small. There'll be the commissioner, there'll be a very senior lawyer, uh, and one or two other lawyers. So an average law commission team is probably only three or four people. And we've learned over the course of 50 years that having extra numbers does not necessarily improve the quality of the final production. A team of three or four is a very good number for an average size project. So all our lawyers and our researchers are very much in the front line. They have a direct impact upon the way the law changes uh, and they put forward their draft reports to the commissioners as a whole and we review them and accept or reject them or send them away to be reformulated. But we listen very carefully to what our lawyers say. They make submissions to us, they answer questions, they do presentations. Uh, and so everybody in the commission is very, very closely involved in law reform. And I think our young lawyers, and many of them are in their 20s and 30s, that find this quite exhilarating. You know, if you're in government generally as a civil servant, you're usually quite a long way behind the front line. Whereas in the Law Commission, you have direct input as a young lawyer into a really exciting project. Um, so it's quite a horizontal, flat organisation. We don't have strong hierarchies. I wander around our offices and everybody calls me Nick. They, there's no formality or there's very little formality in the place, but it's a very friendly, very vibrant organisation. And, and we do get uh, lawyers from Europe. Um, our research assistants quite regularly come from Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, the United States. Um, we get about 500 applications every year for about 20 places, but they come from all over. Um, and that's fantastic. It really adds to the, the excitement in the organization. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you very much. And I, I would highly recommend uh, the Law Commission reports. I relied on them very much as a student because um, there, is, there is a saying in Polish that two heads, two heads is better than one and it works in English too. 65 heads is of course better than one, certainly better than the one that I have. So having people who have looked at the law and very succinctly summarized the, the history, existing problems and potential ways in which we could reform it. I think the Law Commission reports are absolutely fantastic. I thought it as a student, I still think it now. And um, we, we will highly recommend to our students that. Uh, they, they should start with Law Commission reports. It's a pity they're not on everything, but uh, every year they get more and more and uh, and those gaps get, get fewer and fewer. So um, thank you very much for, for having talked to us about your, your role uh, at the Law Commission. Now, if we could move towards your, your role as a Lord Justice uh, of Appeal. Yes. Um, now, the British Law Centre students very often ask us it, in fact, some of them even say it seems like a breach of the European Convention of Human Rights, that there is no automatic right of appeal in English law. It's very common for someone who loses in, in, in Central and Eastern Europe to automatically go to, to the Court of Appeal. What, why is that not the case in England and Wales? I, I think one has to differentiate between a right of appeal on the one hand and the Court of Appeal on the other hand. 
almost every decision that's taken by a court or tribunal can lead to an appeal. So uh, it may lead to an appeal to another court lower down the system. Um, now, the Court of Appeal uh, is one of three courts in the United Kingdom uh, which make up the senior level of the judiciary. So we have the High Court, for which there is a maximum of 108 judges. There is the Court of Appeal, we're just over 30. And then there is the Supreme Court, which is 12. So those are the three top levels of court in the United Kingdom, which is a nation of about 66 million people, <laughs> comprises 150, approximately 150 judges. Now, we all know each other very well. It's a small community, but that governs the three highest levels of courts. Now, below that, you've got approximately 30,000 judges in the criminal courts, the lower civil courts, in the tribunals that deal with specialist areas of law. And if you start your case in one of those, there will always be a right of appeal. But it doesn't mean to say you can go right up the tree all the way to the Court of Appeal. So to give you a few statistics, uh, the Court of Appeal Criminal Division uh, deals with about 5,000 applications each year for an appeal. But just because you apply to the Court of Appeal doesn't mean to say you'll be given a hearing. Uh, the number of cases that actually lead to a full appeal may be a tenth of that, uh, or maybe a, a bit more than that. Uh, so, so far as civil cases are concerned, the court that I'm concerned with has approximately 800 applications to it per year, of which about 25% are immigration cases and 75% relate to everything else. Um, and uh, you have to get permission to appeal before you actually get your appeal heard. So part of the work of a, a court of appeal judge is to take a set of papers uh, where someone's seeking permission to appeal and decide whether or not permission should be granted. Uh, so if your permission, if permission is not granted, reasons will be given. You'll get a very short judgment, a few paragraphs as to why it's not arguable. Uh, the test has to be that there's a, a reasonable prospect of success. It's an arguable case. If you don't get that, you'll get some reasons from the judge. If you do, the case will be remitted for a full hearing. At the moment, the waiting time is about six or seven months to a hearing. Uh, a short hearing would be half a day, about three hours. Uh, in a more complicated case, you may get two, three, four days to argue your case. Uh, that's orally in court. Um, and those will be supplemented by detailed written submissions. Uh, the Court of Appeal is always three judges, um, and we cover every single solitary area of law, and we are the Court of Appeal for the entire country. So that's 30 plus judges for a population of 66 million. Above us is the Supreme Court, 12 judges. They hear about 100 cases per year. So in practical terms, the Court of Appeal, where I sit, is the final court for the vast majority of cases. Uh, it's quite rare for a case to go to the Supreme Court. It has to raise an issue of significant public interest before it goes that high. If it does, then you'll get full argument, which may last a number of days, uh, and you'll get a, a minimum of five uh, justices of the Supreme Court sitting on the case. So it's quite a sharp pyramid. And as you go further up uh, towards the top, there's a filtering process. But I think the important point is that wherever you start on that pyramid, there's always going to be a right of appeal somewhere. You just can't always take it to the top. To, you know, the closer you get to the top, the bigger the public interest issue there has to be before the court will entertain it. OK. And, and, and how does the Court of Appeal decide which of those cases to give uh, permission to to appeal to and if, if it were rejected as, as you just described summarily then is, is there a possibility to should we say appeal against the the summary rejection of, of, the, of the permission to appeal that there's no longer a right to appeal against the summary rejection um, but the court has been working quite hard in the past few years to streamline its processes to make sure that we can concentrate on issues of real importance so we can deliver you know swift judgments after really detailed argument and we take we aim to get judgments out 
in less than three months. Often a judgment will be produced in one to two months following a hearing. Uh, and it, it's usually fairly lengthy. You know, a typical judgment may be 20, 30, 40 pages in length of detailed reasons. Um, to get permission, and I'm, I'm not using the precise statutory language, but it's got to be a properly arguable case with a reasonable prospect of success. Mm. Um, so that's the filter. And, and it, it's, it's sometimes said that the Court of Appeal and, and the Supreme Court um, deal with points of law rather than rather than questions of fact. But, but the Court of Appeal does sometimes involve itself in looking at factual decisions that, that a trial judge uh, has made. Um, when does the Court of Appeal involve itself in, shall we say, assessing factual evidence? Um, and how does it do that if it doesn't hear the witnesses live, shall, shall we say? And when our students were told that I, I would be uh, talking with you, I asked some of them whether whether they had any questions that they, they would like to put to you. Uh, and so maybe I can roll up our, our two final questions uh, in, into one. Uh, one question was, as a matter of practice, how would a, a court of appeal treat a statement from the Supreme Court, which was generally acknowledged as being obiter dicta? would how persuasive are they in in practice and and secondly the the question that i think every law student asks at some stage or another i remember asking this regardless of the jurisdiction that you study in why don't judges simply say at the top of the the judgment here is my ratio decidendi for this entire case and and allow the law students to stop reading at, at that uh, after those first few sentences so yeah. could i put those put those to you yes the, the second is harder than the first. <laughs> we, we do have this distinction between ratio and obita statements. Uh, again, in practice, it rarely has much significance. If the Supreme Court expresses a strong view about the law, but it wasn't strictly necessary in order to decide the case, the lower court would not, we do not get involved in a detailed analysis of whether it's over to a ratio, we follow it. Uh, it. It's a much more theoretical than real debate these days. Um, as to the second question, it's an extremely good question. Uh, it would be fair to students if we provided the answer in the first sentence. <laughs> we, I suppose increasingly in judgments, we will, having written a judgment, go back to the first few paragraphs and say, the issue in this case X is X. And for the reasons that we set out in detail below, the answer is Y. And perhaps that's something we should do more often. Uh, but we're less formulaic in the way we produce judgments than perhaps some of our civil counterparts. Uh, we have individualistic styles, me and my fellow judges, uh, and some people produce longer judgments than others. That's their individual style. Uh, and some people will produce summaries which are uh, liked by students and others judges. <laughs> it's a very, very good question, and I don't have a good answer to it, but I absolutely see the force of being clear and accessible in the first few paragraphs. Excellent. In, in, the, in the Supreme Court, uh, I have noticed um, uh, a change, or at least I perceive there to be a change in the way that, that judgments are written from, again, the, the 1990s, where I remember sitting in a law library until crazy o'clock at night trying to interpret the differences between two, two lords judgments. And now it seems that there very much is an emphasis on as much as possible giving a single statement of law that is agreed upon by as many of the judges as possible and only really producing concurring or dissenting opinions if it's really necessary is is that a, a fair assessment and and is it something that is also attempted at the court of appeal level if it is true yeah it is a fair assessment um there are exceptions to that noble principle um um, but yes, it is a fair assessment. There is certainly a view that it is, if at all possible, sensible to produce a single judgment which expresses the view of all the agreeing judges. It's even more strongly the position in the Court of Appeal. 
Um, it's very rare for there to be dissenting judgments in the Court of Appeal. It does happen, but I, it, it's very, very rare. The, the, the way in which we produce our judgments is, is as follows, that before the case starts, one of the three judges will be assigned as the lead judge and will essentially have responsibility for producing the first draft of the judgment. Uh, and we, when we get the papers, it may be sometime in advance of the actual hearing, there'll be a discussion between us. We have an email exchange upon the topic uh, and we agree who's going to take the lead. Uh, that person will then produce the first draft of the judgment, uh, send it by email to our colleagues and we then have a discussion about it. People will put comments in and the lead judge may amend the draft. Uh, and then once we've got agreement, uh, there's a number of things that, are, that can happen. Uh, I might just produce the judgment in my own name, which says at the heading Lord Justice Green, and then there's the judgment. And at the end, the other two judges simply say, I agree. Or, and this increasingly happens, uh, we will put the three names at the top and we will then say, this is the judgment of the court. Uh, but either way, it will effectively be an agreed judgment of all three judges. Uh, so we do see the great force in producing a single judgment, which reflects the view of the entire court. Now, occasionally a judge has a single point that they wish to add, and they will say, I agree with the judgment of whoever it is, but I wish to add one point, and then they will elaborate upon it. And then even more rarely, and I, I don't know the exact figures, but it's probably, you know, it's probably one in a hundred, there'll be a dissenting judgment. Um, but that's very rare these days. So there's negotiation as to the result. We have a detailed discussion about the case before it starts and another detailed discussion afterwards. And then there are email exchanges. Um, and we'll have a good idea as to where each of us comes from or whether we agree or disagree. Well, thank you so, so much for this. I think that this has been absolutely incredible. Um, I have very much enjoyed it. I'm sure our students will, will enjoy it. So, Lord Justice Green, Sir Nicholas, Nick, thank you so much for having having given up your time. Uh, we're incredibly grateful. Um, and I hope that when uh, the COVID situation is over, that we, we can invite you to come in person uh, one day. Thank you, Steve, Professor Terry. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Bye. Bye.